This is a disposable vape, more specifically an elf bar. And over the past couple of years, these things have become inescapable. Specialist stores and corner shops alike boast huge displays with dozens of flavours and brands. Bar terraces and pub gardens are permeated by clouds of sickly sweet vapour, and they've become so popular in schools that head teachers have begun installing vapour detectors in the toilets. The speed with which these devices have become such a ubiquitous part of modern life has left governments across the world reeling. Where smoking rates had been gradually declining for decades in many rich countries, vaping, and disposable vapes in particular, have been charged with hooking huge numbers of people on nicotine who would never have touched a traditional cigarette. Legislators thus find themselves in a bit of a bind. Introducing harsher regulations on vaping might curb this sudden rise in nicotine use, or it might push vapors to buy devices illegally, increasing the very real risk of people buying vapes which are unsafe or untested. Just as troubling, it might push vapors who had no previous intention of smoking into using tobacco products. But while we are going to touch upon it, this isn't a video about the minutiae of vaping legislation. This is, instead, a video about what the dramatic rise of disposable vapes might tell us about the priorities and perils of contemporary capitalism. While public health officials and vaping industry mouthpieces argue about the impact that these things are having on our society, I want to ask what it is about our society which has led to these highly addictive, highly harmful, and highly wasteful devices being produced in the first place. See, I was recently reading this book by the historian Neil McGregor, A History of the World in 100 Objects. As its title would suggest, the book aims to chart human history through a series of 100 artefacts. Crucially though, rather than pick a random sequence of trinkets, McGregor chooses pieces which are, to him at least, representative of the time, place, and era in which they were made. Objects which say something about the society which produced them. Thus, the old devised stone chopping tool becomes emblematic of the moment in which early humans living in the Rift Valley began to augment their innate physical abilities with tools. Much later, this credit card becomes demonstrative of consumerism and globalization. As fascinating as any of the individual examples, however, is the process itself. Because what this book leaves you with more than anything is a question. If you were to pick an object which contained within it the trajectory and tensions which define the modern world, what would you choose? For me, I think it would be the disposable vape. Like many of the examples in McGregor's book, the humble elf bar might seem mundane or marginal. But from their production, to their marketing, to their disposal, these tiny little devices couldn't be more illustrative of the direction in which contemporary capitalism is headed. The story of disposable vapes is the story of our times, one of addicted customers trapped in coercive consumer relationships of cash-strapped state regulators struggling to bring rule-breaking corporations to heel, of the increasing presence of Chinese companies in American and European markets, and, of course, of colossal, planet-killing waste. In fact, with so many different angles to cover, I've decided to split this topic across three separate videos, each of which will explore a different way in which these little things reflect the greatest challenges facing our economy, society, and planet. For our first stop on this intellectual journey, I want to focus on addiction and to explore the several ways in which corporations are taking influence from the vaping industry and seeking to build a capitalism in which our addiction to certain products becomes a central feature. Let's start then by stating the complete and total obvious, that vapes contain nicotine and that nicotine is addictive. Shocker. I know. There's all kinds of complex chemistry involved in this to do with brain receptors and dopamine production, but the crux of it is that the more you puff on one of these things, the more you're going to want to puff on one of these things, until eventually you feel you need to puff on one of these things. From a purely business perspective, this means that selling vapes is a pretty good trade to be in. 
An addicted customer is a customer who doesn't need much marketing to or winning over with good service. Their chemical dependence on your product keeps them coming back for more regardless. This is true despite there being plenty of similar products available which all have the ability to fulfill that customer's addiction in much the same way. Evidence from cigarette smokers suggests that the mental association between satisfying those neurological cravings and tasting a particular flavour causes many nicotine users to cling resolutely to one particular product. Of course, the irony is that the first commercially successful vaping products were marketed as medical devices intended to help cigarette smokers end their dependence on nicotine. When Chinese pharmacist Han Li first developed the concept of vaporizing nicotine in 2003, the idea was that a device which mimicked the physical experience of smoking a cigarette was likely to be more effective in helping people give up smoking than existing aids like nicotine patches or gum. And while well, the issue is far from settled, there is evidence that e-cigarettes are a pretty good quitting tool. The problem is that while vaping might help many smokers to give up cigarettes, a significant proportion of those quitters don't then take the next step of giving up nicotine use entirely. They continue to vape in much the same way as they smoked before. Worse than this, others who never would have touched an old school cigarette are lured in by promises of vaping being less harmful and end up picking up an addiction that they never would have had otherwise. While this might be bad from a public health perspective, from a business point of view, it actually makes selling vapes a much more attractive proposition than selling combustible cigarettes. Because cigarette smokers have this overwhelming tendency to die. All of which puts vaping companies in the envious position of having a customer base which is just as addicted to its products as cigarette users ever were, but who are likely to be breathing for long enough to be purchasing those products for a much longer time. This is, in many regards, the dream business model for any company. The numbers are so good that it's convinced many tobacco companies to pivot away from selling cigarettes and to enter the vape market instead. But when we take a step back, we find that big tobacco is far from alone in preying upon addiction in this way, and that in recent decades, countless industries have sought to establish similarly coercive relationships with their customers. There are, of course, several other big industries which trade primarily in addictive substances. In his 2019 book, The Age of Addiction, the historian David Courtright refers to these industries as limbic capitalism, named for the manner in which they prey on our limbic systems, the part of our brains which control pleasure. Companies which participate in this limbic capitalism might advertise, they might attempt to make products that are better than those of their competitors. But they don't primarily engage with us as rational consumers who are using facts and logic to decide which product will make our lives better. Instead, they treat us as little more than pleasure-seeking beasts whose logical faculties are easily disarmed by a desire for easy dopamine. Some of the industries which comprise this limbic capitalist economy are easy to spot. The alcohol industry and coffee industry both similarly trade in addictive substances. There's also a growing body of evidence that some foods which contain a high amount of fat and sugar can create a chemical dependence upon those who eat them. And that's before we even begin to think about whatever it is these people are doing. But limbic capitalism is not confined to companies which trade in substances. Since the 1970s, researchers have begun to recognise that addiction is as often behavioural as purely chemical. And this isn't just some woke expansion of technical vocabulary either. One study published in 2017 found that the sight of a slot machine or betting shop lights up the same neural pathways in the brain of a gambling addict as the sight of alcohol does for an alcoholic. The gambling industry and the porn industry, both of these have been known to induce or encourage addictive behaviours in order to keep their customers coming back for more. But the industry which Courtright cites as having supercharged limbic capitalism is big tech. Such fears about the addictive effects of the digital tools which now rule our lives were first raised by a Google employee called Tristan Harris in 2013. That February, Harris began circulating this slide deck among colleagues. Titled, A Call to Minimize Distraction and Respect Users' Attention, it asked searching questions about the impact that Silicon Valley tech companies were having on their users. 
Harris drew particular attention to the way in which product designers at Google, Apple, and Facebook were exploiting certain human vulnerabilities, which, he suggested, make people act against their better judgment. He compared the design of email inboxes and social media apps to slot machines. The pulling of a page to refresh messages, mimicking the pulling of a lever on a one-armed bandit, teasing users into believing that just one more refresh might finally summon that jackpot promotion email or the lottery win of an actually interesting Facebook post. This might sound a little exaggerated or alarmist. Harris wouldn't be the last tech bro to convince himself that he'd created a bit of software so powerful that it might represent an existential threat to humanity. Yet, yeah, I'm sure many of us have, at one point or another, detected a level of compulsion in our relationship with social media, or have experienced a sense of anxiety on not being able to locate our phones. And this is not an accident. Tech companies put considerable effort into cultivating these feelings of dependence. Implementations of what developers call persuasive design have turned tools which were meant to make our lives easier into sources of addiction. Facebook, Gmail and Tinder's various pops and whirls no longer serve to save us time or expand our worlds, but instead absorb hours of our attention as we refresh and refresh in search of anything which might bring us some joy or hope or righteous anger. Much as the vaping industry seeks to downplay the health impacts of habitually breathing in formaldehyde, so too are tech companies are economically incentivized to overlook the negative health and social impact of addiction to their products. Because, as we all know, the more time you spend gazing into the glossy black abyss of your phone, computer, or tablet screen, the more ad revenue or subscription money they're raking in. Harris's presentation was intended to encourage developers to be more thoughtful in how they design their products. But persuasive design techniques have since spread like wildfire throughout the industry, to the point where pretty much every digital service now takes the form of a specialized slot machine. Video game loot boxes turn the wonder of imaginative play into a casino. Tinder turns the dating scene into a casino. Duolingo turns your French to English phrasebook into a casino. And Robinhood turns the stock market into more of a casino. But when I say that the same business model which is used by vaping companies has become the norm across much of our economy, I don't just mean that corporations have been preying upon actual addictions. Because whether in relation to vaping or video games, the appeal of having an addicted customer base is less the addiction itself than it is the manner in which that addiction takes away consumer choice, guaranteeing return customers. And in recent decades, companies which sell completely non-addictive products have nevertheless worked out how to rig the system to ensure that customers have no choice but to keep buying their wares. Perhaps the most consequential example of this system rigging involves these. This is not another vape, this is an insulin pen, as carried by many diabetics. Unlike nicotine, alcohol, or social media, insulin is not addictive. There's no high or cravings associated with using it. Nevertheless, for those who have been prescribed it, it's not optional. If someone who needs insulin doesn't inject it regularly, there's a very real chance that they might die. Which means that, from a purely business perspective, selling insulin is another pretty good trade to be in. Because one of the ways in which the insulin industry differs from the nicotine industry is in regards to competition. Unlike with cigarette or vape brands, insulin users have no reason to develop any kind of compulsive preference for a particular company's product. If one company started charging too much, then hospitals, pharmacies, and patients would simply switch over to buying another one. Or they would if it wasn't for this. This is a patent awarded by the US Patent Office to the pharmaceutical company Sanofi. Having been approved, it grants the company the exclusive right to manufacture, sell, and license its Lantus brand of long-acting insulin. If you or I managed to reverse engineer this particular type of insulin and tried to sell it, then Sanofi would be within their rights under law to come and shut us down. 
These patent protections mean that competition in the insulin market is all but non-existent. In the US, three patent-holding companies are responsible for 90% of all sales. This has allowed them to act much like a cartel, charging extortionate prices for the drug. Only in 2023 did the moral depravity of this system become enough of a PR nightmare that companies reluctantly agreed to lower prices. Even since those price cuts, insulin manufacturers have continued to fight tooth and nail to protect themselves from meaningful competition. They do this through a practice called evergreening. This involves making minor tweaks to either the recipe or delivery method of a drug and then registering the new recipe as an entirely new invention. In doing so, pharmaceutical companies are effectively able to reset the clock on the 20-year period in which their drug can't be copied and thus to extend the amount of time over which they have total control over what they charge. Sanofi's monopoly over the production and sale of Lantus, for example, should by some estimates have ended in 2015. But a set of more spurious secondary patents filed since Lantus was on the market currently looks set to protect the company from any meaningful competition until as late as 2031. Even without a customer base which is literally addicted to its products then, pharmaceutical companies have worked out how to prey upon captive markets, using and abusing restrictive patent laws in order to protect themselves from competition. The result is a clientele which is every bit as reliant on Sanofi or Novo Nordisk as vapors are on the makers of Elfbar or previously Juul. But what about industries which aren't lucky enough to be able to rely on a ready-made captive market in this way? Well, increasingly, where dependence doesn't come pre-cooked, companies are unleashing a whole arsenal of methods for creating it. The clearest example of this is in the proliferation of what's sometimes called the razor and blade business model. The story goes that when King C. Gillette invented the disposable safety razor in 1904, he also came up with a revolutionary new way of marketing and selling his new product, which served to vastly increase the amount of revenue he was able to make from each customer. Gillette's master plan was to sell the razor handles at a slight loss in order to tempt new customers into trying out his new system. The twist being that once customers owned the handle, they were very likely to keep buying blades for it for years to come. By maintaining a sizable profit margin on the blades themselves, then Gillette could make far more money than he lost on that initial discount. According to this story from the Harvard Business Review, this story isn't entirely true. The Gillette company didn't actually adopt the razor and blade model until a little bit later. Nevertheless, the strategy has proven remarkably popular. Not only has it been picked up by pretty much every razor manufacturer on the market, it's also spilled over into countless other industries too. In May 2021, Microsoft's Vice President of Gaming, Laurie Wright, was called as a witness in a court case between Epic Games and Apple over the 30% revenue cut that Apple takes from purchases carried out through its App Store. During that testimony, Wright revealed that in 20 years of selling Xboxes, Microsoft had never made a profit on a single unit. As with Gillette's razor blades, hardware units are consistently sold either at cost or at a loss in order for the company to establish market share and onboard new customers. Whilst profitability comes from selling accessories, from commission on sales through the Microsoft Store, and from the sale of Xbox Live subscriptions. As with insulin, the razor and blade business model doesn't require customers to be either chemically or behaviorally addicted to the product. But outside of a few committed enthusiasts, most people aren't going to buy multiple razors or games consoles. Once someone has picked up an Xbox then, they find themselves similarly deeply reliant on Microsoft if they want to keep gaming. Particularly with the rise of digital downloads, actually using the console is likely to involve many years of handing over cash to Microsoft in subscription fees and download commissions. Once you start looking for this model, you begin to see it everywhere. Printers sold cheap to lock you into buying expensive ink cartridges. 
Kindles discounted to trick you into buying DRM protected ebooks, coffee machines for going beans in favour of brand specific pods, or Polaroid using nostalgia to sell you ludicrously priced film. All of this serves the same end of eradicating choice and competition. Other companies might have to work hard to repeatedly win your custom time and again. The Razor and Blade model instead binds us like addicts to a particular company, guaranteeing them our custom for months, years, maybe even decades. As with the pharmaceutical industry, the Razor and Blade business model is largely made possible by the abuse of restrictive intellectual property laws. The very same laws which protect Sanofi's monopoly over Lantus also stops Gillette's competitors from producing alternative blades for the Gillette Fusion. These companies also engage in their own form of evergreening to keep customers in their proprietary ecosystems. It's no coincidence that when Nespresso's patents over its pod system began to expire in 2021, the company just so happened to decide that the time was right to introduce a new system with new patent-protected pods to the market. In this respect, it's pod-based vaping systems like the Joule which represent the perfect product under this particular form of capitalism. By requiring customers to buy proprietary refill pods for their vapes, Joule managed to combine the chemical addiction of nicotine with the monopoly protections of patent law to create an almost unthinkably coercive customer-company relationship. At the height of its power, this allowed Juul to capture 75% of the US vaping market. Of course, Juul has since found itself in hot water, with the FDA having issued a nationwide ban on most of the company's products in the US. And from this standpoint, the fact that Juul's throne has since been taken by single-use disposable vapes might seem like a victory for consumer choice. The reality, however, is that the rise of the disposable vape actually reflects a broader evolution in how major companies have been iterating on the razor and blade model in recent decades. Let me take you back to April 2012 and to the launch of a new product by the creative software company Adobe called Adobe Creative Cloud. Although what made Creative Cloud stand out was that it wasn't really a product at all. It was a service. Adobe was offering customers the option of paying $49.99 a month in return for access to every single piece of software the company made. At the time, this was a pretty big deal. That $50 a month fee might sound high, but Adobe software was expensive. Photoshop alone could cost nearly $1,000, and the master collection containing Adobe's entire suite of apps cost $2,500. On top of this, new versions were released roughly every other year, meaning that even after you'd shelled out all that cash, you'd very quickly find that your software was out of date. Particularly for freelancers and small businesses then, the appeal of this new model was actually pretty clear. Previously, access to such software had required substantial upfront investment, but now it was a relatively manageable overhead which could be paid for over time. That the package granted access to all of Adobe's apps was a pretty good side benefit as well. At first glance, this software-as-a-service business model might seem quite distinct from the razor and blade strategy. After all, Adobe's contracts only lock users in for a maximum of a year, after which they are entirely free to cancel and to switch to a different software package. The problem is that switching is rarely that easy. Once you've been using Photoshop for an entire year, you're likely to have quite the stack of PSD files on your hands, which can be used in some other software, but not particularly reliably. You'll also have developed muscle memory for shortcuts and developed efficient and satisfying workflows for using that particular software. Switching to a new piece of software therefore has a very real cost in terms of losing the ability to edit old files and in decreased productivity whilst you get up to speed. The various side benefits of these subscription packages are also often oversold. Whilst having access to all of Adobe's 20 plus apps might initially seem pretty cool, I'd wager that most users don't use even a quarter of that on a regular basis. 
and whilst a Creative Cloud customer might save some money compared with buying a new software package every two years, never having the option to save an even bigger amount by skipping a version or two can quickly mean that you're giving Adobe far more money than you ever would have before. Like Elfbar, Sanofi and Gillette then, Adobe's found itself in a pretty enviable position. By luring customers in with a relatively low cost of entry, it's managed to design any real competition out of the system, keeping customers hooked not with chemical addiction or patent-protected consumables, but instead with their own collections of proprietary save files. Over the past decade or so, all kinds of industries, which used to sell us one-off products, have followed in Adobe's footsteps and pivoted to offering us services on a subscription basis. Spotify, Netflix, and Microsoft Office, to name but a few, have all replaced hefty upfront purchases with much lower but indefinite monthly fees. And it's not just digital services either. Everything from socks to snacks and books to beer seems to now be available in subscription form. Such subscription services often stand accused of being kind of scammy, turning a profit on the backs of customers who sign up for free trials or for limited subscription periods and then forget to cancel. And this is a very real phenomenon. One study published last year found that auto-renewing subscriptions allow companies to increase their revenue from so-called inattentive customers by up to 200%. But intentionally or not, the real power of the subscription model is the manner in which it transforms customers who might otherwise only have interacted with a company once or twice into lifelong regular revenue streams. And it's in the attempt to ensure that lifelong really does mean lifelong that things truly come full circle, and in which the similarities between subscription services like Creative Cloud and addictive industries like vaping become inescapable. What you'll notice about a lot of these subscription services is that most of them offer some kind of student discount. Creative Cloud, Apple Music, Spotify are all available at discounted rates, whilst Microsoft Office is available for free to anyone with an academic email address. People often assume that this is an attempt to make these services accessible to folks who are likely to be a bit financially stretched, either as a good deed or simply to avoid losing them as a customer entirely. The real reason, however, is a little more manipulative. In 2019, Amazon's former director of finance, Julie Todaro, contributed to an article for Vox about the history of Amazon's Prime program. Discussing the decision to give university students six months of Prime for free, she had this to say. The two times in your life when you are most likely to change your shopping behavior are when you're a student, when you become a new adult, and when you have children. So as they got older, they were already sort of addicted to Amazon being the best place for them to get their stuff. In short, university represents a near once in a lifetime chance for companies to shepherd new customers into their ecosystem. If Amazon or Apple or Adobe or Microsoft can win these folks over whilst they're building their habits as consumers, the various addiction-like dynamics that we've discussed throughout this video are likely to mean that these companies can expect to collect regular payments from them for decades to come. This strategy of getting them while they're young is one which has been used for centuries by the alcohol, tobacco and gambling industries. David Courtright writes that the nature of addiction has implications, more precisely temptations, for businesses that sell habituating products. One is to encourage early and frequent consumption. Treat the lads, the saloon keepers used to say, and you'll have their money in the till when they're adults. Even today, companies constantly dance around the edges of the law when it comes to targeting addictive products at kids. As recently as 1997, the US division of Camel Cigarettes was using this jolly dromedary as its mascot in the US. Joe Camel here didn't just happen to be appealing to children. A study published by the Journal of the American Medical Association at the time found that he was significantly better at developing brand awareness among high schoolers than he was among adults. 
During the period in which he was used, Camel's market share among smokers under 18 rose from 0.5% to 32.8%. The problem with these kind of child-friendly marketing campaigns is that they can easily backfire. Even the most free market loving, red tape despising libertarian is likely to feel a pang of unease when they find out that one of their darling children has taken to chain smoking camel lights. The initial success of the Joe Camel campaign then was short-lived, as concerns over youth smoking caused politicians, medical professionals and parents to turn on the company. The popular response to vaping has been very similar. Throughout the meteoric rise of the vaping industry, there was always some suspicion that e-cigarettes might introduce as many new users to nicotine as it helped to wean off cigarettes. When the assumption was that those new users would be adults, however, no one really cared that much. It was only when vapes gained popularity among school kids that governments leapt into action. When we really examine how this new wave of vaping laws relates to other regulations surrounding limbic capitalist enterprises, however, it becomes questionable how much governments are really concerned about addiction itself at all. They may seek bans or age restrictions on substances which can be immediately harmful, such as smoking, vaping and drinking alcohol. But in recent decades, products and services which are just addictive, or for which negative health outcomes are slower to come about, have increasingly been given a free pass. Laws surrounding gambling have become looser and looser. The 2005 Gambling Act turned the UK from a country which vaguely tolerated betting to one in which opportunities to gamble and adverts encouraging us to do so are everywhere. In 2018, the US Supreme Court ruled betting on sports to be a constitutional right, setting America on a similar path. Even when it comes to children, the rush to clamp down on teen vaping stands in stark contrast to a complete lack of action on video game loot boxes. On first glance, loot boxes seem like a prime candidate for the Think of the Children style backlash which ended Joe Camel's career. One report found that of the 93% of British children who play video games, as many as 40% had bought, won or received a loot box. Which should be worrying given that repeated studies have shown a correlation between someone interacting with loot boxes and that same person displaying symptoms of problem gambling. Nevertheless, after a brief spurt of public outcry in 2018 and 2019, moves towards proper regulation largely stalled. Belgium did go out on a limb and ban the feature entirely, but the US, UK and many other countries fell back on allowing the industry to self-regulate, rather than enforcing any proper third-party oversight. This failure to regulate a gambling product, which at best just so happens to be enjoyed by children, might seem surprising, or it might seem like an oversight of ageing legislatures who are likely to think a loot box is something a pirate buries on an island. But once we place gambling and gaming alongside other industries that we've looked at in this video, we see that it's actually part of an ongoing trend in which coercive consumer relationships are becoming more and more accepted. If more countries do decide to ban disposable vapes, these bans will be an anomaly. Sustained multi-million dollar lobbying efforts on the part of companies as diverse as Adobe, Gillette, Sanofi and Meta mean that the law often enables rather than curbs these kind of exploitative, addiction-like customer retention practices through all manner of legal trickery, but particularly through the maintenance of restrictive and unjust patent systems which grant companies lengthy monopolies on products as vital as life-saving drugs and as trivial as coffee pods. Disposable vapes might initially seem pretty marginal to our economy then, but the same tactics which are employed by the vaping industry are increasingly being embraced across sectors. Where literal addiction can't be relied upon, companies have found other ways to hook customers on their products for as long as possible. And the more that consumer choice gets designed out of the equation, the less that capitalism begins to resemble some mythical meritocratic market, but instead an addiction economy in which we're all simply forced to hand over our monthly fees to our corporate masters.
Thank you so, so much for watching this video. If you'd like to watch further installments of this weird little trilogy that I'm working on, then do make sure that you are subscribed to the channel. All that's left is for me to thank my top tier Patreon supporters. Richard, Alan Gann, Gary, Dick on Spain, Bill Mitchell, Al Zweigart, ZC Reese, Zoe Alden, Alexander Blank, Neil Zabildgaard, Sophia R, Sergio Suarez, Strange Weekend, Ricardo Fernandez de Cordoba, Richard Rapoon, Amit Singh Paraha, Gabriel Koch, Jimmy Dunn, Christopher Cowan, Phil Fiasco Linguini, Agent Maxwell, and Glenn Sugden. If you'd like to find out a little bit more about my Patreon, then you can find out about all the tiers and stuff over at patreon.com forward slash Tom Nicholas. Thanks for watching once again and have a great week.